Welcome to the first episode of the Campaign School Podcast, which is produced by the Academy of the Impossible. I'm Jesse Hirsch, and I'm here with Seb Fox Allen to talk about politics in the hopes of making it accessible and transparent and exciting for really anyone who wants to get involved. For this, our first episode, we're going to look at now the start of the U.S. presidential election as the Republicans are effectively finishing their primary process. And this is a great way for us in our Campaign School podcast to go beyond just Canadian politics and extend our reach around the world, or at least around the continent. So Seb, I asked you to join us for this first podcast because I know you follow American politics quite closely. And I'm curious what you think in terms of the dynamics now that we start this presidential election as to what you think both parties will do to on the one hand energize their base but on the other hand keep people interested because it's a pretty long campaign and you think they're going to have to do something to at least mobilize their supporters if not try to get the swing voters over to their side. This uh, this election cycle has gone by very quickly um, in terms of cementing uh, the, uh, the candidates. Um, I know it seems like the Republican uh, cam- uh, campaign has gone on for a long time, um, but in fact uh, it's wrapping up pretty early and there's a long summer um, left for both the Obama campaign and the Romney campaign uh, to be able to frame uh, their opponent uh, and their campaign uh, in the way that they want. Now do you think uh, Romney will use the same type of frame that Republicans have been using so far for Obama's first term? which is? to both try to marginalize and even alienate him from their base. And conversely, what kind of tactic do you think the Democrats will take now that they have an actual candidate with whom they can either start attacking or if not undermine? Well, the Republicans have been using um, a tactic throughout Obama's first term um, and even uh, into the last part of George W. Bush's term. Um, and that is to, uh, to drive the debates right by taking positions that are much farther um, towards the conservative end uh, than maybe even they intend to have as policies. I mean, a good example of that could be um, the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. Um, I think a lot of people uh, during Obama's first campaign thought that when he was talking about health care reform, he was essentially talking about a single payer. Um, and the Republican Party did, and frankly, effectively, um, is they staked out a position much farther to the right than their demands and forced Obama to come in with a plan that actually quite resembles both in terms of individual mandate um, and still maintaining um, private insurance. Um, in, so into something that, that is quite similar to, to what they would have proposed a couple of years earlier. So do you think they're doing this to distinguish themselves against the incumbent or is this an effort to try to push Obama more to the center where they'd be perhaps more comfortable in terms of the policies that come up? Well, I think that's exactly it. And what's interesting about um, the tone that Obama has taken, at least in the first couple of weeks of what we might call the campaign, um, is he's uh, done the opposite of what uh, Democrats have typically done, what John Kerry did, for instance, or Al Gore did. Um, he's moving quite uh, strongly towards the center left in this case, um, using um, a lot of language, including using language about increasing taxes, which even if we're talking about incre- increasing taxes on rich people, that is not something that's been run on really since, uh, since 1980, um, when Ronald Reagan ended up beating Jimmy Carter. Well, and it suggests that both parties are really looking at their core supporters as the basis for either their re-election or election. What do you think that'll do in terms of the swing voters? And, and, and the, certainly in the last election when there was a increase in voter participation, do you think this polarization will alienate the middle or will it motivate them to pick sides? We have to remember that American politics uh, works quite differently than sometimes we might expect um, based on the reporting. Often um, things are framed in terms of Obama at 48% and Mitt Romney at 46 or 44 or 50. But uh, really what it comes down to in U.S. politics are a series of between six and ten swing states um, that will dictate the election. Uh, These include big states uh, like Florida um, and Virginia um, and smaller states like Colorado or sometimes Arizona. Um, I think what's interesting about this campaign at this moment is that um, Obama is leading in all of those key states, including Michigan, which is Mitt Romney's home state, 
or one of his home states, maybe I should say. And so if the election were held today, uh, it would be quite difficult for Mitt Romney to come out on top. Now, as I said, there is a long way to go, um, and those are bound to firm up as Republicans begin to shed their illusions of Mitt Romney as a candidate for the primary and uh, start to gel around him as a candidate that's representing them in the general election. Well, and it's interesting too, the extremism, I think, on, on, on both sides of the political spectrum in the U.S. in terms of trying to vilify and, and even dehumanize their opponent. And it'll be interesting whether the, the candidates themselves and the parties proper either try to exaggerate and amplify that type of extremism towards their own benefit, or if they'll try to distance themselves to look as if they're the moderate candidate amongst the sort of rabid supporters. I mean, do you think there's any propensity, especially given the role that the internet will play, that the campaigning could go over the top and, and become rather absurd and surreal? Especially given the, the sort of trolling culture on the internet. Can we expect trolls when it comes to the presidential election? We certainly can. And, and not only that, but we can expect trolls in places uh, where we haven't seen them before, in the super PAC uh, world, uh, in a post-Citizens United um, election. Um, I mean, it used to be that, um, that if you wanted to go negative as a candidate, you had to stand behind those attacks and you had to be open to be confronted about them later. Um, with uh, with different groups um, that will run, uh, that will saturate markets with TV ads um, and increasingly saturate the internet, it certainly could get pretty wild. Now here in Canada, we obviously don't have the same type of presidential primary system that kind of primes the electoral pump, but we did recently have a leadership contest for the, the current second party, the NDP, in which uh, Thomas Mulcair ended, w ended up winning, but one of the candidates, Peggy Nash, is going to be our guest uh, coming up at our campaign school. Do you have any thoughts on what we should be asking her in terms of the way that race played out and now how it'll translate in terms of the House of Commons? Well, certainly I have some uh, good questions for her, and I would certainly encourage anyone listening to this podcast to either attend in person if they could or submit uh, you or I questions um, on, on Twitter or, or Facebook if they're interested um, in contributing to that discussion. What I would be interested in knowing from Peggy Nash is how she feels that a leadership race has changed since she was involved with them early in her career. Indeed, that's a good question. And I'll certainly remind listeners that the hashtag campaign school is what we use. And so it's certainly one way to either submit questions or give feedback about this podcast, something we do hope to produce weekly to both augment what we're doing at the Academy and provide a means, I think, for all of us to reflect on the stuff that we're learning through the school. So thanks again, Seb, for uh, joining us this week. And I look forward to talking to you again next week. Thanks, Jesse.